the dam is breaking for one Jerome Powell because Mohammed El Arian is saying it's time for him to hit the bricks. We'll <laughs> see if he listens to Mohammed and more than that on today's Rebel's Edge. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> Welcome back, folks. He's Pete Nigerian. I'm John Nigerian. And boy, we have a packed show for you today because we're going to dive right into Macro Minute as we have one Mohammed El Arian. I'm sure somebody you guys are familiar with. He's telling Fed Chair Jerome Powell to voluntarily relinquish his position in order to ensure the central bank's independence. He says, basically, Pete, that it is no longer viable for him to remain in that position because if he does, uh, between Bissent and President Trump, they're going to have to get rid of him one way or another. And uh, that would probably destroy some of the independence, maybe not all of it, but some of the independence. And that's why El Arian is all over him today. He is. I mean, I'll tell you what, if, if you're Powell, you got to be looking around behind your back just going, all right, who's next? Who, who's the next guy who's going to throw me under the bus, right? And let's be honest, right, for a second at least, and I, and I think Alarian would probably hopefully agree with this, but, you know, one of the excuses has been, and there's always excuses, I get it, but one of the excuses, John, has been, well, you know, with these tariffs, uh, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty. And I think to some degree that's a pretty – fair statement. But that being said, um, the pressure is on. <laughs> it's come off a little bit from the president. He's kind of backed off a little bit from what he was saying for a while, John. But um, it's interesting to see somebody like Alarian just sort of step in and say, hey, look, you need to step out. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's it's kind of amazing, quite honestly. And he, it's not like he's the only vote either, by the way. I mean, he, he's the chair, of course, but, you know, there's quite a few people in the, that room too, right? Yep. There are quite a few people in the room, Pete, but uh, I tell you what, people are definitely paying attention to El Arian's comments as well as Bissette's comments uh, regarding, uh, hey, uh, you've got a huge overrun on this building, uh, the Fed building that they're redoing for two and a half billion dollars. That, that, there's I mean, no excuse. <laughs> no, there really isn't. All right, well, fantastic futures are gonna certainly play off of Mr. L. Arian's comments, Pete. And we're back down to 4.3% for the 10 year uh, and probably going lower still. You'll know that there's a better and better chance that Powell will step down if that approaches four, uh, which I think it could over the next several weeks, Pete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, John, I'm looking at that volatility index, which we always look at. And we, you know, my first two things I look at every single morning, volatility index, and I like to look at the tenure. And then after that, start expanding everything out. But with the volatility index sitting there still right in that same category in the last month, sitting there between 16 and 18, and that's exactly where we're sitting right now, I don't feel like there's a lot of fear out there at all, and and probably for the right reasons. I think there's been a lot of actions, and obviously it's earnings season, and we've had some really nice uh, results so far. We've got plenty more to come, you know, <laughs> over the next couple of weeks. But I, I'm pretty excited about where we are. I know we jumped up about three percent this morning early on the VIX, and then it started to ease back, and it's probably going to be going back and forth. But back and forth where between 16 and 17, probably. Well, let's jump into some stocks if we can here, Pete. <laughs> let's, let's talk about Badger Meter. BMI is the symbol here. This one's fallen apart this morning. Badger Meter, um, water control company, uh, basically their results were better than revenue expectations. Sales were up. So why are people hating on them so bad? Well, as you might imagine, um, they do have some issues about uh, expectations going forward. And that, that seems to be the driver here, Pete. Yeah, I think you're right, John, on that one. And they did miss on the earnings. Obviously, the sales were great. They were up 9.9% year over year. So that's that's pretty solid. Um, it's also a stock that's sitting kind of right in the middle right now in terms of the 52-week low and high. So you don't, can't really get much off of that. I'd also say this. I'd, I'm not sure in that category what the PE should be, you know, because depending on where you are, but looking at this one specifically, 
and I see the PE of something close to 52, maybe it is a little bit lofty based upon where things are. And, and obviously with the earnings kind of pulling back a little bit, even though you've got those great revenue numbers, those sales numbers, the operating margin is kind of basically flat, which you'd like to see a little bit better margins maybe coming in. I think for those reasons, uh, I can understand why it's going down. Probably not to the extent that it is, 14%, but that seems a little bit overdone. But nonetheless, I can understand why people are sort of putting out their hands a little bit today. Well, General Motors, they're not putting out their hands to uh, buy it. They're putting out their hands palms first, Pete, <laughs> which means they're out there selling it. GM is also down only half as much as uh, Badger. Uh, it's down 7% today. Uh, they took a billion dollar hit from tariffs, apparently, Pete, but they still beat expectations uh, for the quarter. Uh, in other words, strong sales. That was great. People love to see that, in particular of uh, trucks and SUVs. That's what really makes their, butters their bread, if you will, Pete. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of the rest of it, not necessarily so good. And depending on what happens with the tariff negotiations August 1st, uh, it could be a little dicey for them for the next several weeks. And when you say a little dicey, I could say that it's probably could be a lot dicey because one of the things that uh, was mentioned by G GM, John, was, well, with the trade and the, and the tariff impacts, there's potential for a loss or uh, the bottom line could get hit by four to five billion. Holy smokes, really? And by the way, when you were talking about the uh, the trucks and SUVs and, and how they actually had some pretty solid sales, that's 100% right but they were primarily the ones that were not EV. These were gas trucks and, and SUVs. So just a little bit of insight into this whole thing. It, it, are they under pressure? Some pressure for sure, but it's not heavy duty pressure today, John. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's down 7%, but I think looking into the future, just the thought of them potentially having the bottom line move by four to 5 billion, that's probably scared off a few people who are usually gonna hold on to GM. Well, I think people that held on to DR Horton are happy they did it, Pete, because uh, DHI blew by estimates. Uh, they were projected to earn about two ninety two. They did over three dollars and thirty six cents. So that's a blowout. Um, the revenue number also much better than expected, Pete. And uh, their pre-tax profit margin, even though it was down from a year ago, obviously some of the uh, cost of goods and things, that go into making homes went up, but still 13.8%, not so bad. Yeah, when you crush it on your earnings, which they did, they didn't just beat it, they crushed it. They beat it by damn near 40 some odd cents or something, John. They also, you know, they beat up on the revenue, I'd say as well. That was pretty strong. I, I think a lot of these things were so unexpected, right? Because we've heard about, you know, where the, where the mortgage rates are and all the rest of the things, but it seems that for, for some way or another, DR Horton seemed to be able to move around and navigate through that pretty well. The cancellation rates actually dropped just a little bit, not a lot, but 17% versus the year over year, 18%. So when I look at all of that, John, and I see the stock up 14%, that's a heck of a move in a single day. It's actually up year to date now, but if you go all the way back from 52 weeks, it's still down about 15% or so. Heavy, heavy volume, a lot of lot of folks going in and out of this one. I'll tell you what, I think the next quarter or two, actually, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on the housing market because I do think we're going to finally see some of this stuff go. We're going to maybe see some rate cuts, John, and maybe we'll see that affect what's going on in the mortgage world. So I, I'm looking forward to a pretty solid second half for Horton and that whole building uh, community. Well, um, now we'll dive into another one, Pete, that was seeing a, a pretty good rally early on. Um, and some of that may have gone away, but AEHR. Uh, so this is in the testing systems. And these guys came out with a, a follow-on orders for their new hyper power system. They call it a hyperscaler, I guess, Pete. And uh, the numbers uh, that they were talking about were just extraordinary, and it's because of the usual suspect, AI. So in other words, burn-in AI chips is what uh, was really in strong demand, and these guys really capitalized on it. Yeah, they absolutely did. And, you know, it's it's an industry that we all know is going to just go up, 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 up. And I think the the important part here, John, is that their, their cooling system is what gives them 
this added thing that the process is going to have as far as some of the, the delivery of the power and the storage capacity and all the things that they, they do for a living. But how about this? I, the, the one stat that I came away from this whole thing just staring at was 2023, well, AI chips, uh, about $60 billion industry. Well, 2032, $600 billion industry. So these guys are in the right place at the right time. The stock has had a really nice move to the upside, hit 52 week highs today, just underneath 22 bucks a share. And oh, by the way, the volumes, the volumes of trade are absolutely off the charts relative to average, about 4X, probably 5X by now, because it's already been about a half hour since I last looked at where this stock was, but really impressive company for sure. There's no doubt about it. And I think they're in the right spot at the right time right now. Well, we're having a lot of difficulties with John's connection right now out there in Newport. And I'm sure he's right when he told us earlier that there are so many people there and so many people tapped in that they're probably over, <laughs> over the amount that they can actually service at, at one time up there in Newport or something like that. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of sports topics that we were going to touch on anyway. So here's the first one, Saquon Barkley, NFL, right? When we look at what Saquon Barkley has done, everybody talks about how, what an amazing person he is. And he was with the Giants. And then he got this great contract to come over to with Philadelphia. And that was all great. But what people don't know as much about is the fact that this guy, similar to John and I, he's a guy who's a football guy, but he's also combining himself with a financial stuff. And what is it? What do I mean by that? He's one of the first guys that I knew of back in 2021, not the very first, but one of the few guys who decided, hey, I want to start getting more involved in my personal wealth and everything else. So I want to get involved with Bitcoin. And I and that that's his passion. So in 2021, he signed an endorsement deal where any endorsement deal that he did, that money gets funneled over to Bitcoin. And, and that puts in his portfolio, which is pretty interesting thing for a guy to do a young guy, a young football player, a lot of the guys probably would have shied away from that. He didn't. He grasped right onto it, like several of the athletes that we talked not too long ago about this. Maybe last week, I think we were covering this. But so all his endorsement money is going in that direction. He's got a partnership with Strike, which is a platform that converts and directs deposits into Bitcoin. So that's the way he has set this up. Now, we talked about Russell Okong, where he took half of what he was making 13 million bucks and threw 50% of the salary into Bitcoin. So depending on how long these guys have held or if they've held on to it, they have done extremely well with this. And it just shows you, you know, a lot of people look at the football players and they say, well, you know, these guys are big and strong and this and that, but you know, they're not very savvy. Well, actually I think quite a few of the guys are pretty intelligent, pretty savvy with what they want to do with their investments and all the rest of it. And certainly we uh, we've seen multiple different, folks over the last couple of years on um, different teams, different everything that have gotten themselves involved in the world of, of crypto, in the, in the world of Bitcoin specifically, because that's the biggest and the baddest. So most likely that's, that's the one that's going to see the most activity from some of these athletes. And I just think it's great. And I love that they're doing it. I've worked with financial literacy with the NFL myself. So I get where they're coming from and the fact that they want to do that and talk about it in the locker room. I think it's awesome. All right. Next up, we got one more thing. I want to talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers because I think the Pittsburgh Steelers are one of these teams that probably isn't giving getting enough credit for what they did in the offseason because they have one of the best coaches I think in football with Tomlin. He's he's a guy who's he, has he gotten over it, uh, the top not not recently at least and so people might be a little bit frustrated by the, with that but he's a guy who's going to get a team even when the team's not that great into the playoffs and maybe make a deep run. So what have they done that I'm so excited about? Well, everybody's going to say, well, Pete, yeah, they, they signed Aaron Rodgers. That's 100% true. But how about the fact that Tomlin, who's a defensive guy and a very aggressive guy, has built that defense into something that's absolutely unbelievable, and this is how they did it. He picked up Darius Slay, cornerback. He put up, picked up Jalen Ramsey, cornerback. He got Juno Smith, tight end. He also got a wide receiver in DK Metcalf, who's absolutely a freak show that cannot be guarded. We also have a team that already had a tight end, but they added all of this. And on the draft side of things, not just free agency, but the draft side of things, they went very deep into the draft with primarily almost all defensive players. Oh, no, by the way, the best rusher right now, at least as of this past year, um, had an unbelievable contract just the other day. T.J. Watt, three years, $123 million. 
That's the highest payment any player has gotten who is not a quarterback. So gives you a little bit of an idea of how much they think of him, what he's been able to do in his career there. Obviously, his his brother was an unbelievable player with the Texans. He's been absolutely a freak show with Pittsburgh. And by the way, one of the guys that they did draft that wasn't a defensive player, Caleb Johnson, probably, arguably, one of the, if not, you could put him right up there with the Heisman Trophy winner, but or, or the second place Heisman, Heisman Trophy gentleman. But I got to tell you what, something. When I look at what Caleb Johnson did as a career and what he did his senior year at Iowa as a running back, he only averaged six and a half yards per carry. I mean, this kid's a freak show as well. The Pittsburgh Steelers are a team that's going to be very, very good this year. They're in a great conference division and all the rest of it, but they could get to the top. All right, folks, I hope everybody had a great day. Sorry that uh, John wasn't able to join us for the sports, but I'm sure he'll be back here tomorrow with me, one o'clock Eastern time.